Welcome to Giant TV. Today I'm talking with Egan Christensen. This is an executive you don't want to miss. His career has been incredible and just his Y2K story alone you're not going to want to miss. He's got a lot going on right now and he's going places. Let's go talk to Egan. Hi everybody, this is Paul Hitchcock. I'm the founder and uh, president of Giant Jacks Media. We're an agency that helps others to grow and stand out. And this is my show where I love giving back, bringing value to everybody that watches this. Really excited for my guest today, Egan Christensen, who's a executive consultant in the San Francisco Bay Area. Welcome, Egan. Thank you so much, Paul. Appreciate that. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm so excited because you and I had a chance to talk before and I just uh, think you know, your background's incredible. And this is all about understanding what you've done and what you're doing now, where you're going. And other people love hearing stories. So I just want to jump in and tell, tell us a bit about your background, how you got started in business and what you've been doing. Oh, thanks. I appreciate that. Yeah, as you mentioned, I live here in San Francisco and uh, got a little bit of a diverse background. Um, you know, I started my career early off uh, working for my dad. Uh, my dad was a, a structural engineer. And uh, first project out of college was working with uh, NASA and Lockheed on the Aeros Missile Access Stand, which is like a, a big, uh, big portable trailer that you could go and, and manage and work on missiles. Yeah, and I've heard, I've uh, it was a great companies. education. Yeah, yeah, it was it was an amazing, amazing education. I learned so much. And, you know, here you come out of college and you think you know it all. I knew nothing. And uh, that practical work level was just fantastic. And I grew up doing a lot of stuff with my dad. My dad was definitely an entrepreneur and a big influence in my life. Um, so after working for my dad for a while, I jumped over and got into the construction area. And uh, dad was also a AAA general contractor. So growing up, I got, you know, was raised to, to, you know, swing a hammer and do other stuff. But in this case, I was management. And I was right. doing estimating and, and those types of things for a, a small firm out of uh, San Jose. Uh, and, uh, after a few years of being up in the morning at five in the morning and, you know, uh, chasing down, you know, uh, uh, contractors and tradesmen, I, I looked around and I went, this technology thing is really taking off and there's no reason I'm, I'm living in the Mecca of technology. Why aren't I over there? <laughs> and so uh, I reached out to my, uh, to my mom of all people who worked for a small sheet metal company oh. and, uh, she was a operations manager there. And she said, um, you know, I've got a great headhunter that helps us build, you know, people uh, when we need, when we have a uh, role openings, why don't I connect you with him? And I said, great. So went over, met with them, gave him my resume. And within a week, he had me interviewing with uh, Hitachi Data Systems, uh, right. which is now Hitachi Ventana. Now, and uh, how, how so old were you I, at this point, how, how old were you at that point? I was 22. So still young. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, still young. And um so uh, I interviewed with him and he's like, well, you don't really have the tech experience, but you certainly have computer skills. And I started rebuilding computers when I was 12 or 13 in the early days when, you know, 14, 4K baud and 2800 baud was fast, right? Uh, yeah, and I complain now about my gig speed. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, uh, he set me up with Hitachi Data Systems and it was a project manager for their business process reengineering team. And uh, HDS was run, which I didn't know at this time, was a, a conglomeration between EDS and Atachi. And EDS reached out to Atachi and said, we think we can sell your mainframes, your storage oh. systems. So they formed this conglomeration of HDS, that's the name. And um, out of that, they named six people from the EDS people were on the executive team. And they had three or four folks from the Hitachi team that came in and, to help run it. And they bought uh, the national semiconductors that they bought over in uh, Santa Clara. So uh, when I came in, they were looking at how do they kind of better operate their overall sales process, put better sales tools, institute new rigor and paradigm into what they were trying to do. And uh, I met with the VP of sales and he goes, well, Egan, you know, clearly you're a people person. And he goes, uh, even though you don't have the, the tech skills that I'm looking for, he goes, I think you could help me come on over. And uh, so they took me into their wing and I stayed through, I don't know, five or six different roles. While I was at Atachi contractor for the first two years. Uh, and then uh, slowly went over, went to work for the VP of, uh, of uh, development for the company, a guy named Min Lee, who's still really good friends with. Yeah. And uh, there I got to learn how to go talk to CEOs, CIOs, and CTOs. Uh, he used to hold kind of these little group conversations. And I built the first wireless network and was kind of his tech IT guy, uh, as well as a facilitator to, to run these, these shops. And so 
I owe a bunch to Min because he really, really helped me kind of get yeah. my chops in speaking with executives. Yeah. Um, and then after that, um, I got promoted. Uh, I got asked to come over to the HR department and I ran all the HRS systems for Hitachi. Wow. And about two years into that, the CEO reached out to me and said, you're doing a great job down there. Our, uh, our director who is running all the, the uh, IT infrastructure, specifically our Oracle infrastructure, is leaving. Uh, we think you're the right guy. Why don't you come take her role? So I got transferred over to that group and uh, fought my way through lots of fun battles there, running the, all those systems, ended up taking over all the CRM systems ultimately, um, and coordinated all sorts of fun stuff, including, you know, the integration of Sun Microsystem when they were reselling our right. products and right. automation to help drive that and, and tools and services to do that. And I had a great team that worked with me at that time. Same area, uh, and same geographic worked, area? All in Santa Clara. Oh, okay. uh, but I was doing it globally. So uh, I ran, uh, I rolled out, you know, Oracle uh, to 126 countries. I traveled to over 90 countries while working for Itachi. Um, <laughs> and then uh, during the middle of all this, this little weird thing called Y2K appeared. <laughs> and I got asked to uh, head up the Y2K program. Really? So uh, I, I sat on the governor's board uh, for Y2K and I sat next to you know, guys like Maynard Webb, who was the uh, C CIO over at eBay for a long time, still a, a friend and a good guy, uh, a bunch of other leaders from Bank of America, all these, you know, guys who've had 40 years plus experience. And I was the newbie, you know, the young 27, 28 year old at that point, uh, <laughs> who was in trying to help figure out how to make that work. And uh, it was a, a fantastic learning experience as well. Um, well yeah, and I got to tell so you, then after, and, and, well, let me ask you real quick. So the Y2K sure. thing, that, that, I mean, people forget that was a humongous deal, right? I mean, billions spent on that, and it did it really turn out to be nothing, or was there something there? You know, there was a few things that happened that, um, you know, that, that were of an issue, but overall, no, it wasn't a big problem. People yeah. were afraid planes were gonna fall out of the sky, and, <laughs> you know, their computers would work, stop working, and, you know, banks would shut down, and, you know, I think a lot of people put a lot of prep work into it. There was a problem. Certainly the compute right. systems weren't set up to handle the date codes. And uh, my, uh, one of my claim to fame during that process was my CEO calls me up and goes, hey, I, I just got a call from the telco guys. Turns out our PBXs are not Y2K compliant. Uh, he goes, we can't afford, you know, at, at HDS, we had a, uh, when we sold hardware to our customers, it, we, if they had a service contract with us, if we didn't have support to them within one hour, after that hour, it was a million dollar an hour um, fine to us, um, oh, to that customer. Oh, yeah. So we had customers like Home Depot, The Gap, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you, you name it, all the, all the yeah. big dogs out there. So he pulled me aside and goes, Y2K is nine months away. Um, I really need somebody to lead it. So put your plan together. Let me know what you need. You have an unlimited budget. Whatever you need to do, do and get it, get it worked out. So I flew in. I had you know, uh, backup generators at all our call centers. I had, you know, satellite phones for everybody. I had, you know, round the clock coverage. I had coordination around the globe, follow the sun methodology from one region to the next to make sure that we knew what was happening in other regions before it hit us. And so great counterparts down in Australia who were giving that, you know, 14 hour head, heads up on what they were seeing on their side of the world. Um, but uh, the CEO calls me up and goes, yeah, our PBXs aren't compliant. I'm gonna have to spend 40 million to replace them all. And I went, really? And he goes, yep, 40 million. And I went, wow. I said, all right, well, you know, I'm, I'm meeting with the PBX guy in an hour. I said, do me a favor, give me 24 hours. Let me just have 24 hours to see if there's another approach to this. So he pulls the computer out and I look at it and he, I go, do me a favor. I said, set it for 11.59, you know, 19.99 so we can see the rollover December 31st, so we can see the rollover. And sure enough, it rolls over and the machine locks up. I went, all right. I said, do me a favor. I said, go in and now change the date to January 1st, 12.01 a.m. Run it and test it. And he ran and tested it because everything works fine. And I went, so let me ask you, how many of these do we have around the world? And he goes, 80. I said, how long would it take you to remote into every one of these systems and just actually change the clock on the machine before the Y2K event happens? He goes, 10 minutes. I said, great. So 800 minutes of time, how much staff do you need? He goes, well, I don't know. I 10 people for you know, a couple hours. I said, fantastic, make the changes. He goes, well, our, our, our service clocks are gonna be off and our timestamps are gonna be off. And I went, for 40 million, we'll deal with it for 12 hours where we have the wrong times on the phone. <laughs> and he went, oh. I'm like, now that we've proven it on one machine, I said, go test it on a couple other machines, make sure that none of us look foolish, that we don't take the company down. 
Sure enough, a few hours later, he calls me back. Goes, Egan, it works like a charm. I walked into my CEO and said, don't do it. Here's our, our way around it. So from that point on, um, he had full trust in me and let me do what I needed to do. And, uh, but yeah, I was on NPR. I was, it was crazy uh, how mm -hmm. much fanfare was going on. Uh, my daughter, I remember New Year's Eve, my oldest, who's now 22, she had a, uh, an ear infection and a temperature of 102 uh, while I was, you know, stuck in the office trying to figure everything out. And so, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a crazy time, but it was, uh, it was lots of fun, lots of great learning. <laughs> so, then, uh, did you, you were, were you overseas for a while or traveling overseas a lot? Well, you know, as a kid, my, my dad was into mining. And so uh, he was born in Denmark. My mom is from Vancouver, British Columbia. And uh, they met in Vancouver, had my older sister up there, and then they moved to Seattle, where they had myself and my middle sister, and then me. I was the baby of the okay. family, two girls okay. and a boy. Okay. Um, and then when I was two, we moved to Florida. Uh, and then when I was six, we moved to Columbia, South America. And I lived in Columbia from six till I was 12. That's right. Uh, and then we came back to the States very, very briefly, uh, and then went up to Canada. My mom's mom ended up with Alzheimer's, so she wanted to be near her mother. So we moved up to Canada and we stayed in Canada from when I was 12 to about 16. And then my freshman year of high school, we moved to Arizona and then I went to high school and college down in Arizona. Oh man. And being the baby, are you a little bit spoiled or no? No, no. <laughs> Beaten up, abused. No. I've got great sisters. They're lots of fun. Um, one lives up in Oregon. The other was up in Canada with, near my mother. Uh, dad passed away, unfortunately, about 17, 18 years ago now. Uh, but, uh, yeah, she's up in Canada and then they're all doing great and surviving just fine. So, yeah. Well, what are you doing yeah. now? Because you got, you got a full plate now and, uh, I know you're, you're, you're going places too in the future. So what, what are you focused on now? So right now I'm consulting for a couple different firms. Uh, most of my time is spent with McKenzie and a couple of others that I work with. Uh, and I'm helping with sales channels, services, strategies, uh, laying out, you know, best practices, figuring out headcount, staffing needs, uh, what the right go-to-market strategies are going to look like, how do we put, you know, the right plan in motion to support all those, what kind of uh, hiring and staffing does the, the, the companies that we're working for need to put out, uh, figuring out what the right messaging is, uh, coordinating with Gartner and IDC and, the, you know, other companies like that, Forrester, to make sure that we've got good strategies and alignment between, you know, what the market says and what the customer is looking to do uh, and really helping to put together those types of strategies. Uh, at the same time, I have been looking around for kind of my next thing. Um, right. You know, I was with VMware for a little while, uh, for about two years. I was at uh, Dell for eight years. I ran cloud for Dell worldwide um, and came in through a SaaS acquisition. After leaving Atachi, I went to a SaaS company called Everdream. And then from Everdream, uh, they got bought by, by Dell. And then we were integrated with five other companies. Uh, Michael Dell called this his billion dollar experiment. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was the early days of SaaS. And, you know, they didn't quite know how to make it work with us. And they brought all these leaders together and merged us at one time. And as you can probably guess, that was, you know, lots of fun. Uh, they all had, you know, golden silver handcuffs. And within six months, they all left. And suddenly I was running all the teams and uh, managing the whole process and oh, and. Uh, so that was great, too. And I traveled a lot with Dell internationally. Uh, we had, you know, selling our SaaS products and services worldwide. So I covered a lot of the world uh, working for them as well during that process. Uh, yeah. And then at VMware, when I left, I was overdoing um, uh, strategy for professional services. And between then, I was with the startup uh, where I ran the services and operations side of the business uh, for a, uh, a money factoring business where you would pay to get your payments early and we'd bring in teams like uh, Accenture and KPMG and uh, Grant Thornton uh, for their government agencies. And we'd actually go in and help them streamline their payables and find ways to find cash out of their payables um, to cover some of their costs and bring additional funding back into their side and help the vendors by getting cash into their pocket a little earlier. So uh, that was a, a fun little startup where I came in as employee number two. And uh, we ended up getting bought out by a venture firm um, out of London. And the company's still running. They're doing well. And uh, happy to see their success. So, uh, so yeah, so now I'm kind of, uh, you know, doing the consulting thing and kind of keeping my eye open for, you know, where I want to take these years of experience and my, you know, global understanding and, and uh, how I can really leverage all the things that I've been kind of cultivating over the last 25, 30 years and put it into great use. How, how do you do that? I mean, how do you, how do you solidify the next chapter in your life like this? I mean, you, you come across to me, and we've talked a few times now as, you know, type A personality. And I, and I mean that in a very positive way. You got, always seem like you got a lot of things going on. And, uh, you know, this next chapter, do you start 
just networking with with your the people you know or do you take a step back and put a business plan together i mean what's your method for this next chapter no, it's, a, it's a great question paul um a lot of it's networking, right? You know, looking through opportunities, talking to, you know, some of my old buddies who have, you know, either moved in positions and roles and moved up in their careers as they go forward. Um, it's just really about finding that place where I'm going to find happiness and, and joy, right? I, I, right? I am a type A, without a doubt. I, I am driven. Um, but I also really enjoy having some fun through the process. And so if we're not laughing and enjoying who we work with and, and then what we do, then why do it? And right. I've, Yep. Too often I've had, you know, and I've had amazing bosses over the years, mm -hmm. um, so I'm not putting any of them specifically down. But when you do have a leader that you don't get along with or you don't connect with or you're not gelling with, it makes it really hard to want to do that job. And so right. I'm really finding, trying to look for, you know, that spot where I can really, you know, bring that value that I bring to the table. And it's a little bit of everything you said. I'm, you know, working through my LinkedIn contact. I've got an outline of kind of the roles that I want, where I want to be. Um, I'm looking for, you know, like a VP of professional services, customer success, something in channels. Um, so those are the kind of the core areas that I'm really focused on because I think that's where I get the most, uh, you know, bang for the buck out of Egan. Um, yep. Someone asked me a long time ago, when you're having a bad day, what do you do? And my short answer is go see a customer because there's nothing like talking to a customer who's got lots of different problems, issues and challenges and feeling like you can bring either some empathy to the situation some understanding of, of what they need to do based on your you know, relative years of experience and find ways to connect with them on an interpersonal way that allows you to cultivate that relationship. People buy yeah. and trust people that they like. And so yeah. it's not about just being liked, it's about coming in and being that right value add to the process and making sure that you're there to you know, support their business needs and challenges. Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it. You seem like you're at a point in your career where you don't, you don't need to take a job for the sake of the job it's more of you know what uh you know what you're happy doing which is a phenomenal place to be in yeah definitely you know i'm, I'm you know as like in anyone else uh you know, i'm not ready to retire um and i don't know what i'd do with myself if i retired so <laughs> um I, you know i i want to get engaged i want to get involved i you know i love being part of the game and and being out there and really bringing that value and that that energy to the process. Um, I like meeting people. I really do. You know, a lot yeah. of people don't like it. And I enjoy building that relationship and putting that, you know, the A team to keep people together or those those critical A players, let's call them that, you know, really know how to drive and get things done. Um, you know, dealt with challenges, dealt with people, you know, that, that don't do what you want to do. And you can help and nurture them. And some you can't. Some, you know, you got to move on. And, and so... You know, it's building that process and really bringing in all those those things that allows me to feel like I'm bringing value to the process is what I'm trying to do yeah. right now. Yeah. When you're not working, yeah. I mean, you got so many things going work wise, but when you're not working, are you one of those persons that like, OK, you just turn it off and then you go back to work or do you also have stuff away from work where you're going a million miles an hour, too? Well, I, you know, certainly I'm a, I, you know, binge watch like the be the best of them in the world. Uh, there's always, you know, something good to watch on TV of, of oh, some, yeah. some caliber, not all great. Some, there's some right. really ph phenomenal stuff out there. Uh, I am writing a book right now um, oh, about my experiences in South America and we'll save that for another, another time. But uh, yeah. definitely uh, my family had some great adventures down there. So I've been kind of starting to pen that out and have an outline done and asking for my family to give input because I was 12 or 13 when we left. I want to make sure that, you know, I'm getting it from all lenses. Um, uh, about four years ago, I picked up playing guitar. So wow. uh, I have some buddies that every Wednesday night we get together and have a little jam night where we uh, just play awesome. some music. And it's everything from, you know, uh, Hotel California to <laughs> The Dead to Bob Seger to some blues stuff to, you know, whatever we feel like doing. And uh, it's just a great way to, to kind of, you know, let that left right brain go. I, I suck at it. I really do. I'm, I'm awful, <laughs> but I, I'm getting better. Um, right. A few of my friends have excelled so much faster than I have, and I'm frustrated. But at the same time, it's something that, you know, keeps you engaged, keeps you driven. Uh, I've got, I don't know, five or six guitars poked around my apartment. So uh, they're always in front of me, forcing me to, you know, pick one up and play and spend some time on it and always try to get better. Um, I'm a computer geek at heart. I really am. I love getting on computers and tweaking on them and making them run better and faster. And so I, I am the IT guy for my family. Whenever there's an issue, I am logging on to Team Viewer or whatever app we have in house at that time to uh, help drive that forward. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, and, you know, lots of stuff in between. You know, uh, I, I'm in San Francisco. It's a beautiful city. Yeah, you right. you want to get out. You want to enjoy it. You know, we've yeah. had some amazing weather recently. So, right. you know, getting out and making sure you're getting to see the world is also important. And uh, now that COVID's over, well, not over, COVID's on its way out the door, excuse me. Uh, and, you know, I've had my second shot and feeling good. I'm definitely right. looking forward to, you know, getting out and seeing the world again and starting to do some more travel because I really love to travel. And uh, right. so I'm, I'm looking forward to spending some more time on the road, whether it's for work or personal. I don't care at this point. I'd really like to find a way to get out and see some more of the planet again. Yep. No, I'm with you. Egan, I could talk to you for the next few hours. I mean, you're a really fascinating guy with a lot going on. I appreciate you coming on board. And I want to thank everybody for being here and then yeah love to have you back as you get into that book i'd uh, love to see what's going on with that but uh yeah thanks for spending some time with me and i know you and i will stay in touch absolutely paul appreciate it and good luck to you guys out there and uh appreciate the time today you're welcome all right take care all right